Buon Noite, good evening, and welcome to our trip into the unknown. My name is Tatiana, and I'm a neuroscience PhD student here at the Champali Mo Research Program. I'm here today with you because, as most of you, I guess, I'm very curious in the power that psychedelics have in changing our brains and treating our minds. This event is a part of a Champali Mo Research community-led science outreach initiative called R. Spanning over 40 events in almost 10 years now, we have covered fascinating scientific topics. These events are usually held here in Lisbon in our beautiful Sampalimo Center for the Unknown auditorium that overlooks the Teja River. However, today we are together virtually in what is our first online uh, event ever. And we had uh, almost a uh, thousand people re registering, registering for tonight, so we couldn't be happier. We hope we can bring you some of the R magic to wherever you're watching us from. And so for tonight, we, keep, we kept it a bit, uh, a bit of the normal, uh, our structure. So first we'll have um, an introdu introduction talk uh, with some contextualization on the topic, including a brief summary of the history of psychedelics. After that, we'll have two invited speakers, one in-house specialist and a very special external speaker. They will dive deeper into how these substances are being researched for its potential in the treatment of mental health disorders. And by the end, we'll have a round table with all of the speakers and some other special guests where uh, they will discuss and try to answer some of your uh, questions. And so the questions will be collected by our amazing crew that will be checking at all times the comment sections of our official platforms. And so by the end, our panel of experts will try to answer them. And during the event, for those watching us via Zoom, you also get the chance to interact a bit more with us by answering uh, polls that will pop on your screen. So let's try it now. For our first poll, please answer the question that is going to pop up on your screen. So if you were diagnosed with a mental health disorder, would you consider being treated with psychedelics? And so from one to five, one uh, being not at all, and five uh, definitely. I'll give you a bit of time. Okay, are you done? Perfect. We'll have a couple more polls throughout the event and we'll share and discuss the results by the end in the round table. And now for the next few minutes, we'll have Tiago Candera, who is a neuroscience uh, PhD student uh, here at Champalimo uh, Research. And he will tell us how he got interested in psychedelic research and how the history of these substances brought us where we are today. Tiago. Thank you, Tatiana. My name is Tiago, and I'm a PhD student here at Champalimo Research. Before we dive deep into the history of psychedelics, I would like to tell you how I became interested in researching the therapeutic potential of these substances. People usually say that after experiencing trauma, they start to see their lives from new perspectives. I myself have been through a process like this. About 10 years ago, I was admitted into a hospital with a severe illness. I ended up staying in the hospital for close to three months and most of that time in complete isolation. While I was at the hospital, as a freshly trained psychologist, I began to wonder about the transformative potential of this type of experience. The new perspectives I got came with an expansiveness of my interests and the relaxation of what I thought were once my very strong priors. The topic of mental health was one that I always carried close to my heart. In fact, to this day, I struggle with mental health problems. It was thus natural to me that I became interested in researching what treatments were available that could leverage the flexibility that I felt my brain had just experienced. It was then that I stumbled upon research on psychedelics. Psychedelics are usually associated with transformative processes. For millennia, humans have used psychedelics for spiritual expansion and healing purposes. In fact, several communities across the world, and particularly in South America, have historically preserved distinct species of animals, plants, and fungi containing psychedelic psychoactive substances. 
A particularly interesting species is the psilocybin mushroom. It contains psilocybin, a psychedelic compound that has been on the spotlight for the treatment of depression and that you'll be hearing a lot more from later today. But after all, what are psychedelics? From their Greek etymology, they are the combination of the words mind and manifestation. Indeed, a person experiencing a psychedelic state often describes it as an expansion and manifestation of their mind, often revealing of new perspectives unknown to them before. These insights often manifest themselves in the shape of hallucinations. During a psychedelic trip, visual hallucinations are the most common. However, these can take shape in most sensory domains, tactile, auditory, and they can even affect your sense of smell and flavor. Most interestingly, they have also been described to have the potential to change your thoughts in surprising ways. Psychedelics are a family of drugs that act primarily on the brain's serotonergic system. Serotonin is a naturally occurring molecule in the brain. It regulates physiological functions such as sleep, mood, appetite, and is even involved in decision-making processes. My PhD project revolves exactly around this subject, but for today, I'll spare you the details. Serotonin is a neuromodulator, and as such, it can alter the way neurons talk to each other, allowing for more or less traffic of information between them. It mainly acts on the synapse, which are the bridges that connect neurons. Serotonin can act on a neuron by attaching to one of several different docks. These docks are called receptors. The leading theory is that psychedelic drugs emulate the function of endogenous serotonin. However, psychedelic drugs in the brain mostly attach to a specific serotonin dock or a receptor, and thus affect primarily the functions in which this receptor is involved and not necessarily all the functions that serotonin is involved in. When psychedelics are consumed in high enough dosages, their interaction with the serotonin system is what causes the often called psychedelic trip. There are several types of psychedelic drugs. Some of them are present in nature, like DMT, mescaline, or psilocybin, while others were synthesized in the laboratory, just like LSD. And while today's event will focus mostly on the potential of psilocybin, will first take you on a trip of the history of psychedelics in general. As I said before, these psychedelic drugs have been used for millennia by people across the globe. In this talk, I'll specifically focus on the story of how they disseminated in the Western world and research. The Western story starts in the 1930s, where Albert Hoffman, a Swiss chemist, was looking to develop novel pharmaceutical drugs. In 1938, from one of his failed experiments, he synthesized a substance he called lysergic acid dithylamine, or LSD for short. However, he dismissed this discovery as a failure. It was not until five years later, in 1943, that he decided to revisit this substance and that while working on it, he accidentally absorbed a small amount through his fingertips, discovering for the first time the power effects of LSD. Three days later, he decided to intentionally ingest LSD for the first time. The effects began to take shape while he was riding his bicycle home. He described his experience. Now, little by little, I could begin to enjoy the unprecedented colors and plays of shapes that persisted behind my closed eyes. Kaleidoscopic, fantastic images surged in on me. The next morning, a sensation of well-being and renewed life flowed through me. This day, April 19th, 
known as the Bicycle Day, remains a celebrated date in psychedelic culture to this day. But while Hoffman thought he had discovered psychedelics in the 1950s and even before, others were traveling to remote locations across the world to experience these drugs. Following the discovery of LSD, artists and curious people alike began to explore it and other psychedelics and introduce them to the Western world. In fact, due to the similar effects of psilocybin with LSD, it, not it did not take long for Hoffman to get a hold of this mushroom. Soon after, he isolated this substance and synthesized its psychoactive compound, naming it psilocybin. He and many others across the world first learned about this substance in 1957, when Life magazine published the cover article Seeking the Magic Mushroom that popularized the term for this drug until today. We were in the peak of the Cold War, and these substances had caught the attention of the US government. Their mind-altering effects were now one possible strategy to improve interrogation techniques and explore the potential of mind control. It was actually with funds from this endeavor that, in this article, the ritual in which psilocybin was used by the Mazatecs in Mexico and its effects were described in thorough detail. But with the Cold War came its counter movements. The most famous of those, the hippie movement. Hippie culture was characterized by saying no to war and rejecting societal norms. Psychedelics and psychedelic culture were central to this movement. Without restrictions, LSD and psilocybin were now freely available. During the 60s, hippies, artists, and activists advocated for the use of these substances, often making use of the famous drop acid, not bombs. Artists across the globe, like the Beatles or Janis Joplin, wrote the anthems of psychedelia and helped propel this culture worldwide. Meanwhile, Psychedelics also caught the interest of several research groups across the globe. Thanks to Hoffman and others, LSD and synthetic psilocybin had become easier to access in dosage and thus making them appropriate for use in research scenarios. Beginning in the early 50s, psychedelics had been used to treat a whole host of conditions, including addiction, depression, obsessive compulsive disorder, schizophrenia, and so on there had been 40,000 research participants and more than 1,000 clinical papers published on these topics. The American Psychiatric Association had whole meetings centered around LSD, this new wonder drug. In fact, there were six international scientific meetings devoted to psychedelics between 1950 and 1965 alone. Some of the best minds in psychiatry and basic research were now working hard to understand these compounds in therapeutic models. The potential of the therapeutic use of psychedelics was now clear and impossible to ignore. The evidence and promise of these substances in what was seen as altering the mind led Timothy Leary and Richard Alpert, professors at Harvard University in the United States, to initiate the Harvard Psilocybin Project in 1960. Their goal was to study the effects of psilocybin on human subjects. Leary and colleagues argued that psilocybin, when administered in proper doses, in a stable setting, and under the guidance of therapists, could benefit behavior in ways not easily obtained by regular therapy alone. In one of their most famous experiments, the Concord Prison Experiment, prisoners were given psilocybin. The hypothesis was that they would reduce their likelihood of returning to prison after release, based on the scientists' belief that it would increase pro-social behavior. However, poor design and controversial ethical considerations undermined the results of this study. And in fact, more recently, it was demonstrated that they failed to follow even simple scientific practices and conducted erroneous analysis and presentation of their data. 
Leary and Alpert's conduct brought bad reputation to research with psychedelics and eventually got them fired from Harvard University in 63. During that decade, Leary was arrested over 30 times, not only for his anti-establishment political action, but also for the promotion of the open use of psychedelics. For these reasons, Richard Nixon, the president of the USA at the time, famously entitled him the most dangerous man in America. By the middle of the decade, the consumption of psychedelics and their adjacent activist and political movements became impossible to control and ignore. By 1966, psychedelic drugs were prohibited. With this prohibition that eventually spread worldwide, not only widespread use, but also academic research on these substances came to a complete halt. During this dark period, that lasted for over 40 years, very little academic progress was made towards the understanding of psychedelic substances. But it was not all silence. During this time, a few activists and scientific groups, like Bill Richards, our speaker for tonight, and many others, have worked very hard to erase the negative image associated with these substances and to put psychedelic research back on the map. Due to their resilience, scientists in the last few years have resumed the promising research on psychedelics that had started decades ago. The potential of psychedelics in the treatment of mental health disorders is once again being tackled by scientists like our guests for tonight. The growing global mental health crisis that we are living in today and its inevitable aggravations to COVID-19 makes this research more valuable than ever. So, as a psychologist and a human, there are still fascinating questions that remain unanswered. What are the neuronal mechanisms through which psychedelics act in our bodies and our brains? Are these substances associated with increased flexibility in the way we think? Do they promote expansiveness? And are they good candidates for the treatment of mental health disorders? I hope that by the end of tonight, we'll be able to shine light on some of these questions. Thank you, Tiago, for taking us on this fascinating personal and historical trip. Indeed, there are many open questions and more research is needed to better understand both the mechanisms underlying the effects of psychedelic drugs and also their therapeutic application. And so today, to answer some of those questions, we have with us Carolina Zeibert. Carolina is a clinical psychologist and researcher working here at the Champagne Moore Neuropsychiatry Unit. She will share with us how her longtime interest in helping patients has led her to perform research with psychedelic substances here in Lisbon. Then Carolina will guide us through some promising clinical, clinical results. And finally, she will explain how clinical research is safely being conducted in these novel treatments. Welcome, Carolina. Good evening, everyone. My name is Carolina, and I'm a clinical psychologist with psychoanalytic psychotherapy training and researcher at the Champalimau Foundation. I'm here today to invite you on a journey about investigating the use of psilocybin in the treatment of depression. As in any trip, there are some bumps on the road. I will go over existing evidence and safety measures related to this alternative treatment for depression. I will begin by telling you about my personal trip from psychotherapy process research towards my encounter with the research about psychedelic use for mental health disorders. I was born in Porto. In 2007, I packed my bags and drove all the way to Ulm, Germany and started investigating psychotherapy processes during my PhD. I was interested in exploring what treatment components make treatment work for patients with depression. At that time, I also spent a year in Boston analyzing large amounts of psychotherapy sessions. I found that therapist techniques do not differ so much across different therapies. However, I found that therapist techniques related to interpersonal relationships and emotions were more frequent in successful therapies for depression. 
After my PhD, I wanted to apply the knowledge I gained into clinical practice. For this reason, I moved to Washington DC to pursue my psychoanalytic clinical training. Later in Berlin, I continued investigating processes and outcomes in ongoing psychotherapy trials for depression. I was analyzing the role of the therapeutic relationship and emotional experiencing on therapy outcomes. In this study, we found that higher levels of emotional experiencing in therapies for depression were associated with positive, long-lasting treatment results. It was only after I moved back to Portugal that I heard about psychedelic assisted therapy and its impact on depressed patients' emotional experiencing. I was super excited with the opportunity to participate in a research on psychedelics and mental health led by Alvino Oliveira Maia and Zach Mainen at the Champalimau Foundation. I was particularly curious about the therapeutic process underlying the effects of psilocybin in depression. Different questions started popping up in my head. What is psilocybin treatment? Does it really work? And how does it work? I really wanted to know the answer to these questions. Regarding my first question, what is psilocybin treatment for depression? I kindly ask you to enter and have a quick look into a treatment room. This treatment was inspired by therapists working with the substances in the 60s and learnings from traditional South American healers, as described by Tiago and Tatiana. Currently in research studies that use psilocybin to treat depression, the session consists of patients getting one or two doses of psilocybin in separate treatment sessions. These sessions are conducted in a comfortable setting where psychological support is provided by a therapist. These studies have suggested robust and long-lasting antidepressant effects for psilocybin. From 2011 onwards, five clinical studies were published around the globe one conducted in London and the rest across the pond, two in Baltimore, one in New York and one in LA. These studies included patients diagnosed with depression in different contexts, for example, after cancer diagnosis. These results on symptom reduction were impressive. In four out of five studies, these patients experienced a significant decrease in their symptoms between 58 to 83% reduction on average. This means that across the studies, over 60% of patients showed a significant symptom reduction. These results are promising for patients suffering from depression and could lead us to say, if it worked for them, it could work for everyone. But this is not enough to recommend a treatment to a patient. And why not? What is missing? First, the psilocybin studies have been conducted as separate studies at different times and with different methods. The number of patients involved in the studies is relatively small, between 12 and 51 patients. If we combine the total number of patients from these five different studies, the total is 139 patients. This is not enough. By comparison, the most recent approval of an antidepressant by regulatory agencies involved the trial with around 500 patients studied with the same methods in multiple centers across the world. Additionally, rather than providing the antidepressant to all 500 patients, this study randomized patients to two groups to assess treatment efficacy. Efficacy is an assessment of how well a treatment works in comparison with a controlled intervention. We are all well aware of the studies conducted over the last year to assess efficacy and safety in the different COVID-19 vaccines in order to obtain regulatory authorization. To determine treatment efficacy, we need to conduct randomized controlled 
trials, or RCTs in short. In these trials, to prove that the symptom reduction is actually resulting from the treatment, we need to compare two groups of patients, before and after treatment. One group gets the treatment and the other group gets a so-called placebo, an identically looking capsule that does not have the medication inside. In trials for antidepressants, the placebo pill will typically lead to a therapeutic effect, also called the placebo effect. The improvement of symptoms among these patients may result from spontaneous remission. But more importantly, it's thought to be associated with psychological factors, such as the expectation to get better. This will only occur if the patient believes that he or she might have been treated with a treatment substance. And given the very explicit nature of a psychedelic trip, you might guess why it would be difficult to conduct a placebo control trial when testing the efficacy of psilocybin. However, there are some solutions. For example, active placebos may be used to simulate the subjective experience of psilocybin. This and other strategies are being used in the currently ongoing RCTs that aim to determine the treatment efficacy of psilocybin for depression. Typically, these are large international multi-centered trials, in some cases planning to include more than 200 patients. The results of these trials, if showing definite evidence of efficacy of psilocybin, are expected to lead to the regulatory approval of psilocybin as a treatment for depression. In addition, smaller studies have been addressing other questions, such as how does psilocybin work? This is the question I'm trying to answer in the research study I'm working on. The study, st the study is funded by Fundação para Ciência e Tecnologia and will be conducted at the Champalimau Foundation. We want to understand the antidepressant mechanisms of psilocybin. Does the psilocybin antidepressant effect really modulate or change the brain? Like when we are in the city center and there is a traffic jam, we can either be stuck or if we are flexible, we may take alternative routes. Similarly, our brain has adaptive neurobiological and cognitive mechanisms that may be dysfunctional in depression. We will measure the degree to which some of these mechanisms are changed by psilocybin. While I was preparing for our study to be submitted for regulatory approval, it became very clear to me that with psilocybin as the experimental medication, there are details we need to be particularly careful about. One is the fact that psychedelic effects might be overwhelming for patients with depression. And the other is that it is a controlled substance. So as for any trip, safety comes first. So getting back to car trips. Please join me on my travels in preparation of our psilocybin trial. And now you might ask, where are we going? In this trip, our final objective is to be able to conduct a psilocybin clinical trial safely. How do we get there? We need a roadmap to know how to get to our destination, define which roads to take and plan any stops along the way. Similarly, in a research study, there's a very detailed map, the research protocol, that guides all the events that need to take place and has clear instructions on how to proceed when any trouble occurs. Now we ask, do we have all our paperwork in order? Before heading on our trip, we need to ensure that we have the driver's license, registration and insurance. In a study, this will be the approval of the protocol by the competent authorities. For example, SAIC and Infarmed in Portugal. Certified psilocybin, 
with import and transport authorizations and clinical trial insurance. And who goes on the trip? Our driver will be the researcher. We will have two co-pilots, a therapist and a physician. The passenger will be the patient that will be safely conducted on this trip. He or she needs to be willing and prepared to remain seated for the long hours drive. The physician needs to check patients regarding inclusion and exclusion criteria and make sure that their physical and mental health is adequate to participate in the study. Together, the co-pilots help to prepare the driver and pack the car for the trip, explaining to the patient what might be expected during the travels, what kind of experiences he or she might have and what to do in a situation of more anxiety or distress. Now, we're finally ready for departure. With everyone inside the car, in their respective seats and with their seat belts on, we are finally ready for our trip, starting from the moment the passenger takes the psilocybin capsule until its effect fades off, usually six to eight hours later. After a long trip, one might like to share some past moments and pictures. Similarly, in psilocybin studies, after the psychedelic experience, typically the patient will come in to the research clinic for the chance to exchange any ideas or concerns about his or her experience. This should help the patient to accommodate any changes in emotional states and new insights. We have reached the end of our car trip and I hope you enjoyed the views. I have two take home messages that I want to share with you. First, don't try this at home. We need more evidence for treatment efficacy and how to use it safely. Having patients taking psilocybin in a research setting will help us to avoid unnecessary bumps in the ride. My second take home message, having rigorous clinical research and regulations are a good reason for the studies to take so much time. But once the results are out, hopefully, we will know that these treatments are a safe and an effective alternative to treat patients suffering from depression. Thank you very much for paying attention. I'm excited to have had the opportunity to talk to you about psilocybin treatment, and I'm looking forward to the discussion at the round table at the end. Thank you, Carolina. It is clear now what is being done by therapists to ensure that patients have a safe trip while being treated for mental health disorders with psychedelic drugs. So now for Paul, number two. In your opinion, how important is the role of the therapist in psychedelic treatment of mental health disorders? Again, from one to five, one being not at all, and five being really important. Okay. Okay, so let's keep going. As our special guest tonight, we'll have uh, William Richards. And so Bill is a psychologist and one of the pioneers of psychedelic assisted psychotherapy. He works at the Center um, of Consciousness and at John Hopkins. I think we have a problem. Just a second. Okay, are we back? Okay, so let me start by introducing Bill again, because this is such a special guest uh, that we have with us tonight, William Richards. So Bill is a psychologist and one of the pioneers of psychedelic assisted psychotherapy. He works at the Center of Psychedelic and Consciousness Research at John Hopkins in the USA. Bill was one of the last people to legally apply this treatment in a research setting before research came to a halt, as Tiago explained to you before. Now, he has been one of the first to make psychedelics research possible again. His publications began in 1966 with implications of LSD and experimental mysticism. And more recently, in 2015, Bill published the book Sacred Knowledge, Psychedelics and Religious Experiences. And so for our final trip tonight, Bill will take us through his life experience working with these substances throughout the different eras of, the field of, re of this field of the re research exploring the phenomenological and ontological implications of these results that Carolina just showed us. So welcome, Bill. 
Well, hello everyone. It's very good to be with you this evening. I wish we could all be uh, together in person at the wonderful Champala Mode Center, uh, but we'll make the best of our distance and uh, enjoy diving into this fascinating frontier of knowledge together. My own entry into this field began uh, wow, close to 60 years ago when I was a graduate student at the University of Göttingen in Germany. And just to give a little historical perspective, at that time, Hans Karl Leuner, the director of the uh, Nerven Klinik there, uh, had just written a book called The Experimental Psychosa or The Experimental Psychoses. And the orientation in psychedelic research at that time was that these mysterious molecules would trigger an experimental psychosis that, that might help us understand schizophrenia. And so the drugs were simply given uh, like any other drug, really, with no preparation, no integration, no support during the period of drug action. And uh, that's where I happened to be. Um, I heard that the clinic around the corner from where I was living was testing some new drug that was supposed to trigger memories from early childhood. And I thought that sounded interesting. Uh, at that point, I had not heard the word psychedelic. I had no idea what psilocybin was. But I went in and they asked me if I got drunk very often. I didn't. So they said, uh, we'd be happy to have you as a graduate student research subject. And they led me to this little basement room. Uh, remember, it had a little narrow window looking out over the hospital garbage cans. And they gave me an injection of psilocybin and left me alone. <laughs> they didn't know any better. But maybe it was just luck. Maybe it was my uh, Christian piety from childhood. Maybe it was who knows what. But for some reason, uh, I did not experience any memories from early childhood. But this incredible, transcendental, mystical uh, state opened up. And uh, it was just an incredibly meaningful, beautiful experience. And when that was over, I went back to where I was living on the top floor of the Gerhard Ullhorn Studien Convict. And frankly, I remember lying on the floorboards, prostate, just overcome by awe and gratitude and amazement. Uh, I was one very impressed 23 year old kid. And in many ways, the rest of my life has been footnotes to, to that experience. And I've been integrating it and exploring it in research contexts with all kinds of different patient populations and normal volunteers. Um, to fast forward from that point, uh, you know, I did 10 years of research at the Maryland Psychiatric Research Center which became dormant in 1977. And then there was a decade of, well, actually, uh, what was it more than that, of uh, dormancy, 22 years of dormancy in the research world, uh, at least as far as psilocybin and LSD went. And then in 1999, Roland Griffiths and I were able to restart research at Johns Hopkins. And we have now been there, uh, this is our 21st year and we are uh, going strong. And as you may know, there are uh, research centers working with psychedelics now uh, throughout uh, Western Europe, the United States and Canada. 
um, when I last looked, there were 55 studies approved on clinicaltrials.gov. And uh, it's really a very exciting, hopeful uh, rebirth of the research. Okay, um, many of you know uh, Herman Hesse's uh, Steppenwolf in uh, the tradition of the green door that appears in the garden wall just for you at just the right time. And this is sort of what happens when someone receives a psychedelic substance, especially under ideal circumstances. And if you have the courage to open that door and enter it, in Hesse's word, you enter the magic theater that has as many doors into as many boxes as you please, 10 or 100 or 1,000. And behind each door, exactly what you seek awaits you. A wonderful uh, tribute to the wisdom of the mind in choreographing uh, the content of psychedelic sessions. Some doors open into very joyful, bright, cheerful, inspiring places. Some go into very dark, uh, threatening, uh, ominous places. Uh, but we know that both the pleasurable and the painful experiences can be therapeutically helpful. So among the many different states that occur during the action of psilocybin and similar major entheogens, uh, we honor those personal psychological experiences, the visionary archetypal experiences, and as I will define in a few minutes, what we call mystical consciousness, this unitive state uh, that appears to be deep within all of us. Houston Smith, the great uh, scholar of comparative religions is quoted as saying, ecstasy is not fun. He's not talking about MDMA, he's talking about spiritual ecstatic states. Okay, then there are these potentially negative experiences, the so-called bad trips of panic and paranoia and confusion. And frankly, they are very rare in research these days when people are well prepared and skillfully guided. They seem to be triggered in sessions where people unlock more than they're ready to deal with and they try to control the content and run away from it instead of with support diving into it. And then of course, there are psychedelic experiences that are simply neutral, which often happen with low dosage. They may be uh, intriguing, entail interesting perceptual changes, but they aren't uh, spiritually powerful or psychologically transformative. What facilitates a positive, helpful experience? Set, setting, and dosage. Set is the ability to choose to trust unconditionally, uh, to be open, honest, curious. Uh, it's influenced by what's going on in your life right now. And above all, by your courage, your motivation to explore, to confront, to suffer, to learn, to receive, to relinquish control and go beyond what we can easily put into language and understand uh, beyond our expectations, beyond our systems of belief. The setting is the environment, what gives you a sense of safety, confidentiality. It helps if it's aesthetically supportive, if the music uh, played is chosen with some wisdom and sensitivity, and the interpersonal climate is empathic, respectful, uh, non-invasive. -inv Here's our first laboratory at Johns Hopkins. 
As you can imagine, there aren't many white coats and stethoscopes to be seen here. Uh, it's furnished like a very pleasant living room, a confidential, safe, comfortable, good quality music system. And our volunteers, this is my son, Brian, as a matter of fact, <laughs> just uh, uh, modeling this, but lying on a couch uh, with eye shade and headphones uh, with nice fuzzy uh, sheets, uh, flannel, that just promote a sense of security and comfort. Um, this is the new uh, treatment suite 104 at the Aquilino Cancer Center, where uh, just this past week, uh, four more cancer patients have received psilocybin. It's a very exciting time. Okay, then let's acknowledge physiological factors. Dosage is important. We've learned that most people require at least 25 milligrams of psilocybin in order to access transcendental states of consciousness. Below that, you may have personal psychodynamic experiences that may be very powerful and helpful, but you're unlikely to access what we would call the mystical uh, levels of awareness. Uh, response is influenced by resistance. Some people, their very personality structures make it harder for them to trust, to, to let go to be open to new experiences. Those people may need a few more hours of preparation uh, before they're ready to benefit from a psychedelic session. We know that our bodies naturally generate endogenous dimethyltryptamine. And who knows uh, what's going on when spontaneous transcendental experiences or altered states of any kind uh, occur. So there's a climate that's given before you even take the drug, plus the influence of stress and deep relaxation and uh, other medications and dietary factors. So it's really a, quite a complex picture. Let me stress that there is no such thing, if you will, as the psychedelic experience. Rather, there are many different forms of experiences, many different strata, if you will, within human consciousness. And the psychedelics seem to unlock the door to give the opportunity to explore these other states of consciousness. Uh, personally, I do not find it helpful to think of the experience as being within the molecule of the drug but more to think of it as being in the human mind. And I can tell you at least with uh, LSD, DPT and psilocybin, the main substances I've worked with, if you look at many people in many doses, you find the same strata of experiential content. Another point to stress is the entelechy, the meaningful unfolding from within or the wisdom that's manifested in individual psychedelic experiences. The mind of the human being seems to have a certain intuitive ability to choreograph content. And usually what emerges is better than what anything you could have planned in advance would be. So often a patient or a research volunteer will say, I did not experience what I wanted, but I experienced what I needed. And then to stress again, the value of interpersonal grounding, like grounding an electric circuit, if you will, as a powerful factor in ensuring safety and efficacy. On the border of these transcendental states, one has to relinquish control 
And if you're all by yourself trying to monitor what's going on, that can be very challenging for many people to accomplish. Okay, there's this fascinating realm of psychological, traditional psychological therapy, what has been called psycholytic therapy in the past, generally using lower dosage than we do in psychedelic therapy. And this is a vast realm, incredibly valuable, <laughs> and um, perhaps the content for another lecture sometime. But today I want to take you beyond the uh, battle with our personal psychodynamic demons into these realms that are harder to talk about and less well known in uh, the psychotherapeutic worlds. And that's these visionary archetypal and mystical states. What do we mean by that? Well, these are experiences of geometric patterns, mandalas, fractals, Gothic arches and Islamic domes, precious metals and gemstones, visionary landscapes, and gods and goddesses. People do have visions of the Christ and Buddha and Bodhisattvas and Shiva and Vishnu, Kuan Yin, the Virgin Mary, Fatima Zara, somehow they all seem to dwell somewhere within the human mind. Uh, just to communicate in art, here's some Hindu deities, Kuan Yin, the Buddhist goddess of compassion, the Buddha, who allegedly dwells within each of us, the old images of Jehovah, uh, Alex Gray's Christ, gemstones. Uh, Alex, Aldous Huxley wrote about uh, a wonderful essay, Why Are Precious Stones Precious? Why do we give them to one another at weddings and things like that? And his argument is that they remind us of the visionary gemstones within our minds. Okay, let's pause just a minute. What's going on here? Come on, this is hard to believe. We are, people are reporting this stuff with closed eyes. Vivid, vivid, impressive imagery. Um, Many understand this as empirical validation of Carl Jung's idea of the collective unconscious, this universal cache of images, apparently independent of enculturation, things that are just encoded in our DNA or spiritually accessed, whatever that may mean. And of course, that leads us into the realm of philosophy. And what is consciousness anyway? What is the relation of the brain to the mind? What is the ultimate nature of matter? And there, uh, perhaps some of the uh, quantum physicists may be of more help than anyone in trying to formulate uh, a language for these incredible mysteries. But we know that these things happen and very reliably and very vividly. Let me take you into the model of the Zen uh, ox herding sequence, kind of a metaphor for the spiritual journey, if you will. But it also can describe many different psychedelic experiences. They're searching for the ox, finding the first footprints, following the tracks, first sighting it, approaching it, wrestling with it, taming it, finally riding upon the ox, then be becoming the ox. And then there's this unitive state called no ox, no you. You're both part of something bigger. And then there's the integration of riding the ox home back to the marketplace to chop wood and carry water. And that fits the sequence of psychedelic therapy really incredibly well. And as you approach 
the transition from the visionary archetypal realm where you are still looking and interacting, you're entering into, you're becoming, you're moving in and through the symbol or the archetype. And then there's a sense of dissolving, melting, transcending, dying, and what many people would choose to call the death and rebirth of the everyday self or the uh, individual psyche. Okay, now let's zero in on this thing called mystical consciousness. It's really incredible that mystical consciousness is rapidly becoming a scientific term. And it's nothing misty, it's nothing vague. It's a very specific state of human consciousness. And it's been called many names. Abraham Maslow, a mentor of mine, called them major peak experiences. Maslow himself never took psychedelics. He was just a natural Jewish mystic, but he knew what he was writing about. There are religious terms in Christianity, the beatific vision, Bakwa Wafana in Islam, Sakamuthla in Judaism, Samadhi Nirvana, Celestial Buddha Fields, the Pure Land, Satori in Buddhism and Hinduism, and Wu Wei in Taoism. All terms that seem to point towards this same awesomely beautiful state of consciousness. There are philosophical terms. Uh, Aldous Huxley called it the source of the perennial philosophy, the platonic view of the world. And some of us would simply say, well, it's just a glimpse of enlightenment or momentarily waking up to a bigger world. Walter Pankey, my good friend who unfortunately died in a scuba diving accident when he was only 40 years old, uh, developed the definition of mystical consciousness that we use, uh, which is basically six categories, unity, transcendence of time and space, intuitive knowledge, sacredness, deeply felt positive mood, and ineffability. Unity in, is approached in two ways with closed eyes into eternal internal unity, with open eyes, external unity. Here's one description of internal unity, just to give you an example. I first went to a place that seemed to completely lack the qualities of this world as we know it. I seemed to transcend time and space and I lost complete identification with the real world. It seemed as if I was going from this world back to an other world before this life had occurred. He likens it to a bright silver mass of energy with a strong electrical current. Strangely enough, I felt that I had been in that mass of energy at one time before. When I was there, everything seemed to make sense. A very beautiful world, one in which love was very much a part. The basic theme I perceived was that life continues to go on and we are basically some form of essence from a supreme being and are part of that supreme being. I don't have the fear of death I once had. I am willing to accept the plan of the creator and go on when it becomes necessary to the next segment of his creation. I have found that everyday living seems much more enjoyable. Small things in life I may have overlooked, I seem to appreciate now. I have a much greater and deeper understanding of other people, a much greater capacity to try to fulfill other people's needs. Overall, I think I am a much more content individual, having had the great opportunity to just glimpse for a very short moment the overall thinking of God, of possibly being brought into his confidence for just a brief period to be reassured there's a very beautiful, loving, masterful plan in the universe for all of us. This was a cancer patient, a 40 year old man with young children who actually lived for a decade after this experience. But you can imagine how much that experience uh, enriched and centered his life. 
Uh, external unity, we really don't have time for here. The other categories here, transcendence of time and space, the sense of eternity or infinity, intuitive knowledge, William James called it the noetic quality. And he said, you know, and he also exposed pragmatism that who knows what the metaphysical validity of these states is or might be, but let's look at the behavior. By their fruits you shall know them. But what do people report? The reality of God or whatever your favorite word for ultimate reality may be. Relativity of time, indestructibility of consciousness, spiritual interconnectedness within our minds, absoluteness of beauty and primacy of love, the wisdom of the psyche, and the intensity of these experiences that they feel more real than everyday existence. Jeremy Narby, the anthropologist, says, once you've seen, you can't unsee. Or the unknown in terms of the Champalamaud center really becomes known or recognized. Sacredness, uh, all these architectural images this is from the Blue Mosque in Isfahan, Hindu temples, Gotha cathedrals. Uh, this is a mandala from Bali of Shiva. Uh, <clears throat> an Islamic dome, the Dome of St. Peter's. There's just an intuitive sense of sacredness, even if you feel that you are not connected to any institutional religion. Deeply felt positive mood, all these wonderful emotions, including playfulness. And then the sense of ineffability, that it's beyond the opposites of life, uh, night and day, the one and the many, freedom and determinism, male and female. It's always both and, both and, but it makes it very hard to express in language. That's why in the Tao Te Ching, it says those who speak do not know, those who know do not speak. So, okay, here's the test, folks. Can you define mystical consciousness scientifically? These are the six categories for uh, uh, a plus answer. Okay, what does it all mean? How shall we understand it? It's clearly not just another induced high, like a marijuana or cocaine experience. Is it cognitive impairment? Well, it's a different kind of cognition. No need to call it impairment. Is it a schizoid fight from reality or regression to the womb or infantile functioning? Uh, if there are any Freudians left in the original sense, I think uh, we would have to say there's more going on in that womb than Freud ever imagined. We can really rule out that it's wish fulfillment or the result of suggestion because we've done several very well-designed double-blind experiments where everything is held constant except whether it's a psychedelic or a controlled substance. And uh, those who receive the psychedelic have these mystical experiences. Is it simply activity in a certain part of our brain? Well, who knows what correlation may be, but correlation and causation aren't really the same. And we really can't explain what's going on in our brains right now. Is this revelation? Is this undiscovering really a spiritual core within? What's it good for? Well, it leaves in its wake feelings of awe and gratitude. You may know David Stendhal Ross, this uh, wonderful Swiss uh, Jesuit, I think he is, who uh, has his website, gratefulness.org. He says, if you can feel gratitude, you have the essence of the spiritual life. It changes the self-concept, your whole view of who you are and who other people changes. 
your self-worth changes. You, you can't pretend to be worthless anymore when you've seen this kind of beauty and wisdom within you. You can't pretend to be isolated anymore because you know deep within yourself that you are interconnected and you have inner resources. The so-called higher power of AA and NA is incredibly real. And there's feelings of rebirth and empowerment and new aesthetic perception and often a new appreciation for nature. So in summary here, uh, this gives us all a new appreciation for experiential learning. It's a new concept in psychiatry really that uh, the memory of an experience can be so therapeutically potent. This is one experience, maybe in a matter of minutes during the six hour period of psilocybin action. This is uh, not taking your Prozac uh, every night for years. Uh, it's experiential learning. And of course, that leads into the importance of applying these, the new insight and new knowledge in everyday life, which we are doing in palliative care and the treatment of addictions and depression, post-traumatic stress disorder, but not only in medicine, also in education with professional religious leaders and mental health providers, and who knows how it might help people in other disciplines. And then of course, there's the religious applications of these substances as well. What Bob Jesse calls using them in the betterment of well people. And Rick Doblin has this dream of the psychedelic therapy centers of the future uh, when all is legal. So what do we do right now? We continue to design and implement well-crafted research projects. We respectfully communicate with colleagues, the FDA, the EMA, the culture at large. We have a huge educational job to do about the positive values of psychedelics. If the data support it within the next few years, we should see the reclassification of at least psilocybin coming off of schedule one or class A being prescribable by trained people in legal settings. And to get ready for that, we're very busy training and certifying facilitators and researchers and working to ensure insurance coverage. So those people who do not have tie dyed t-shirts and cannot spell psychedelic, but who are suffering uh, can have access to this very potent form of treatment. In conclusion here, welcome to the Aquilino Cancer Center, where I have been the last three days actually, giving psilocybin to four more cancer patients. Uh, the future is now folks, and uh, we really are at the dawn of a new era. era. There are many psilocybin publications. If you just go to hopkinspsychedelic.org, you can uh, click on them and study the statistics if you like. Um, if we had more time, I would say much more. I invite you to pick up my book, uh, Sacred Knowledge, uh, which, uh, isn't even expensive, has not yet been translated into Portuguese, unfortunately. Uh, it is uh, available in Dutch and German and Estonian and coming out in Czech. Uh, but uh, it says so much that I would love to say to you right now if we had more time. So from here, we can move into question and answer. And I look forward to our discussion together. Thank you, Bill. It is really an honor to have as a speaker someone that was and is such an integral part of psychedelic research process, being there before research came to a halt and also now making it reemerge. 
really impressive to hear what it was like in a first person experience. It is amazing how your long life experience in research and therapy allows you to provide such masterful descriptions of the characteristics of a therapeutic psychedelic trip. And so thank you for providing us with what might be the closest experience to such a trip without actually consuming a substance. And so now uh, we'll have the last poll of the night, poll number three. If you were diagnosed with a mental health disorder, would you consider being treated with psychedelics? And so again, from one to five, one being not at all, and five definitely, I ask you to, to answer this question, this last question of the night. Okay, so now for the round table, we, me and Tiago, uh, of course, uh, with our two invited speakers, Carolina and, uh, and Bill, are gonna join us. Thank you for joining. And um, we also have Zach and Albino. Yes, uh, we have two very special guests uh, from here from our very own uh, St. Valimo research. Uh, first off, um, right here next to me, uh, Zachary Maynan. He's, uh, he's um... okay, another technical difficulty. You can use mine, maybe. use hers? No, it's good, it's good. Okay, okay. sorry, I was saying um, uh, we have two very special guests for here from our very own Champalimo uh, research. First off, uh, Zachary Mayen. He is a, a, a long-time researcher in the field of uh, serotonin and with the um, interest in psychedelic research. And he is the leader of the systems neuroscience group here at Champalimo research. Uh, welcome, Zach. And uh, also Albino Maya, he is the head of the neuropsychiatry unit. He's a, a medical doctor and researcher uh, uh, and psychiatrist who specializes uh, amongst many things, also in, in psychedelic research, is, is spearheading uh, some of the study that we have uh, currently ongoing here, like the ones that Carolina talked about. So um, without uh, further ado, uh, let's start by looking at the results of um, a poll, poll number two, and let's see how you responded. So, um, yes, um, when we asked you uh, your opinion uh, of the importance of the therapist, you people clearly thought it was quite important. So let's go back to our panel. Um, Let's go back to our panel and um, ask uh, our experts what they think. Yeah, so maybe we could start with uh, Carolina because this really feels like it's such an important um, person to have on board in our trip. Maybe you can unmute yourselves. I do, I do. I'm just, I'm just meeting everyone again, again. I just think that Bill is much more experienced as a therapist than myself, myself. Uh, but I can just, I, uh, I, 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 I can move I, on I to Bill then. Bill? Yeah, I, yeah, I, obviously I, I feel uh, they're incredibly valuable tools, tools and wisely. Can can you put it louder? If I may, so, I may. I think only uh, one of us can have the mic on. Yes, have the mic I'll start on. with the Q and A, and uh, I will ask now uh, Albino. Uh, what are, so one of the questions from the audience what, uh, was what are the advantages and disadvantages of using psychedelics to treat depression when compared uh, to other uh, most common antidepressants? Albino? So thank you very much, Tatiana. Thank you very much, Tatiana, for the question. And, question. Uh, thank you for um, 
for um, the event. This was a great event, and I really enjoyed uh, um, listening to all the talks, to all the talk. uh, particularly uh, uh, Carolina uh, and Tiago, with whom Carolina I work. And Tiago. Uh, it's really great to, to hear you guys speak about what we're doing together. And of course, Bill, who uh, uh, I met a few years back at the Champalimo, uh, um, when we were starting our, our, our own trip in this. And it's, it was great to hear you talk about this again, Bill. So thank you very much to you too. So answering the question, I think the honest answer is we don't know. Uh, uh, I think we can conceive of potential advantages and we can easily conceive and of potential conceive disadvantages. So uh, the, the, the immediate uh, uh, advantage, if we get to the point where we can actually prove with the adequate trials that uh, the treatment is efficacious, as, as Carolina spoke for uh, uh, very nicely, is that we could potentially have treatments that have a long lasting effect after uh, uh, a single session of treatment. So this is a huge advantage relative to the current pharmacological model of taking uh, medication uh, every day. Uh, and uh, uh, in addition with the problems that we, we know so, so much about, which is that uh, we have um, issues of uh, uh, patients getting back, get, getting, getting sick again, if for some reason they stop their medication. So if this is uh, definitively proven, it's going to be a great advantage. But, but I think we also need to consider the, that our current antidepressant treatments were at the time when they were brought into treatment, incredibly revolutionary. So they, they brought the treatment of common mental illnesses like depression and anxiety to primary care doctors. They made treatments much more accessible and uh, um, the way that uh, uh, psychedelic assisted treatment is being thought about and tested uh, is going to be challenging in terms of allowing access to those that might have uh, uh, least possibility of access to such um, a complex form of treatment involving physicians, psychiatrists and therapists. And I think we need to take that very seriously into consideration also. Thank you. Hilera, do you want to go for the next question? Um, yes, uh, so we have an interesting question. Uh, maybe you can go ahead and uh, pass the call on to Zach as he hasn't replied yet. Um, so someone in the audience is asking, so what are the next big questions to be answered uh, in the field of psychedelic research? Uh, we'd love to hear your wild speculations. Let me uh, try to say a few words about that. You know, just looking at depression, which is our major focus right now with the FDA, uh, you know, there are two very large studies uh, in process, one uh, organized by Compass Pathways in London and one by the USONA Institute in Madison, Wisconsin. Uh, there are these are stage 2B studies. Uh, if they all go well within a year or so, we'll be in phase three and just going patiently moving through the drug development process. There have been a number of smaller studies with psilocybin and depression at Imperial College in London, at Johns Hopkins and so on uh, that are in the literature and they look very promising. So, you know, it's going to take a while to uh, work with a large enough sample that we can say that this is reasonably safe for most people uh, and to know who we would screen out and uh, what training of therapists is required for uh, basic safety and efficacy. Uh, and we're moving into this new terrain just as uh, uh, courageously and sanely as we can, uh, but we're, we're on our way and uh, we welcome you to join us, you know? Cool. This is really promising, uh, super exciting um, avenue of research. 
Um, so in terms of uh, more mechanistic uh, underlying uh, in our brains, um, Zach, what, 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 do you, what are your, your opinions on where this research is going next? Research. I mean, so as Tiago mentioned in the introduction, one of the big issues we have right now is that there were uh, several decades of time when psychedelics could have been researched, but research was essentially halted or all but halted. So actually it's, it's in maybe not an atypical scenario where we know that there's a promise clinically, but we know quite little about the basis for, for, that, uh, for that effect. So there's a lot to do. And at this moment, it's still very difficult to actually to do those studies because psilocybin and, and related compounds remain scheduled substances. It's very difficult to work with them. It's difficult to even obtain them to work with. So there's an enormous amount to do and, uh, and it's fairly slow going. But with this uh, enormous interest from the clinical end, there is at least a lot of motivation for labs now to come out and uh, to start exploring uh, what's happening. So for, for our lab, we've, we've mainly been working on uh, serotonin, uh, which is the system uh, involved in the response, both uh, to antidepressants like SSRIs and to psychedelics, uh, psilocybin and, and others. So we're hoping that by shedding light on how the endogenous serotonin system that the brain uses for its own purposes works, we can also help to understand uh, what these drugs might be doing. Anyone want to jump in on that? Or if not, we can move on to a next question from the audience. Um, so a lot of people are wondering, um, we've heard a lot about depression, but are there any other mental health disorders or, or, or health problems that uh, where psychedelics could be useful? Well, uh, probably very many. Uh, there's a lot of research going on and has been going on for a long time using them in the treatment of addictions, uh, alcoholism, nicotine addiction, uh, narcotic addiction, cocaine addiction, with very, very impressive uh, results. Um, the major area I'm personally focused on right now is using them with uh, cancer patients, uh, helping people live the final trajectory of their lives more fully, uh, to kind of, as we say, to live until you die and not uh, retreat and hide in your bedroom feeling depressed and sorry for yourself for the last few months. And uh, it's frankly uh, incredibly uh, inspiring to see how people come alive after a uh, well constructed psilocybin session, even to the extent that the cancer patient almost becomes the social worker for the family, uh, uh, not retreating, but providing leadership and demonstrating how you can live fully uh, every day of your life, including the last one. You know, it's pretty, it really is incredibly inspiring. And that may spread into oncology centers uh, throughout the world in the, new, in the near future. Uh, sunstone therapies uh, just coming into being at the, uh, growing out of the Aquilino Cancer Center, uh, which is actually uh, only a mile from FDA headquarters. It's just kind of symbolically nice. <laughs> um, is really leading the way here. And uh, we'll see what happens there in the next few years. But there are countless applications that could be explored. Uh, at Hopkins, we're starting to look at early Alzheimer's disease symptoms and eating disorders, for example. You know, uh, we don't have much results yet, but we're investigating. 
there was fascinating work done in the rehabilitation of uh, prisoners, uh, early sociopaths. Um, can we affect their self-concept and values enough to integrate people into society instead of locking them up for a lifetime, et cetera. You know, that there, and who knows what the value might be for uh, people who are not uh, diagnosed as ill. If we took a bunch of quantum physicists and gave them a good psychedelic session, where they have a language to talk uh, about these uh, deep, mysterious processes where time and space are different. Who knows how it might facilitate their creativity? Or a bunch of uh, composers, you know, I wonder what they would compose, uh, et cetera. You know, it's really a, a very, I use the word sacred, uh, guardedly, potentially sacred anyway, but very valuable tool. And um, it's been around since at least 5,500 BC, you know, and these drugs emerge in cultures and they get suppressed and they emerge and they get suppressed. And right now they're emerging and let's hope we can be wise enough to use them constructively, you know? I, I, need, seems I like, need one, okay. <laughs> it seems like such huge potential, but actually picking up on the notes of um, cancer patients, and since we are in a cancer clinic, some people were asking whether there was already a clinical trial going on. Um, and so I'll ask uh, maybe Car uh, Carolina and, and Albino to, to answer this. Lina? So, the first clinical trial kicking off at jean -Paul Foundation uh, is actually for depression, for uh, treatment-resistant depression. And we are planning uh, on uh, studying the mechanisms of psilocybin in a cancer population that suffers from depression. So yes, but that's further ahead than the first one that is just uh, kicking off now. Alvino, I don't know. Tatiana, is, is it okay? No. If, is it okay if I ask Bill a question? So, so, so Bill, uh, I, I was, I was, I'm looking at the Q and A, and I'm looking at the chat, and I've, lots of questions people have been asking. I'm guessing people that are thinking if if this might work for them or not. And, and many questions about side effects, of course. So people asking about, uh, uh, is this addictive? Uh, will this create long lasting perceptual changes? Um, uh, what about the neurotoxic effects of MDMA? And, and these are things that, that for which we actually have uh, reasonable literature and, and it's, it's easy to say that given the, the right circumstances, uh, that, that this is that this seems to be a, a pretty safe treatment, uh, but there was one question I saw uh, in in the middle of, of the many others that, that echoed with me because I, I have the same question, and and I was hoping that you as an experienced guide might might have an answer that could comfort me uh, uh, when thinking about uh, my own potential trip one day if it ever comes. And the question is, um, uh, I'm afraid, and this is the question I'm echoing, but I think I might have it also. I'm afraid of going through something like this and coming out from the other side, a different person. So um, I'm sure you've, you've, you've seen uh, things like this happening. And I was hoping to pick your brain about what you think about this, this anxiety regarding the effects of a psychedelic trip, not on your depression, but on you as a person? Well, that's a wonderful question. You're not the only one asking it, you know. Um, the best way I can answer it is that if, if the psychedelic is taken 
ideally in a, a legal situation with good preparation, skillful guidance, the right purity and dosage, et cetera, that if you come out the other end, you will be more completely your, we'll call it your authentic self, you know? You might feel less anxiety, more uh, centeredness, more independence of social pressures, um, uh, more creative, perhaps, you know? Uh, you know, just thinking of the cancer patients uh, I was able to be with last week, you know, we asked them the day afterwards, well, what's different, you know? And they say, well, uh, uh, I'm not anxious anymore. Uh, I can talk to my relatives I've been avoiding. Uh, I, I see uh, the beauty of the world outside more vividly than I ever have before. You know, that type of thing. Uh, I feel more alive, you know? And it's not like I'm different from whom, who I used to be, but I'm more completely authentically who I've always been, is the feeling, you know? And people may use different words to describe, you know, the so-called spiritual dimensions. Some may use religious language, some may use scientific language, some may use philosophical language, you know, some may not know what to call it, but something very meaningful has occurred. You know? Okay, thank you very much. You're welcome. Cool. So actually, that was one of the, our questions next, but... Um, Let's jump to other one that was very um, repetitive amongst the, amongst the crowd. So uh, what is emotional processing? You talked a lot about this in your uh, talk, Carolina. Can you uh, explain it a bit better and how it, this might be important for psychedelics therapy? Well, the second part of the question, I, I don't know the answer, but the first part is to explain maybe a little bit better what emotional experiencing is all about. It's a big word. So I guess it's nothing more than being in touch uh, with your own emotions and being able to think about them, which is easy said and uh, not so easily done. So feeling and being able to think about what we feel in a wholesome way um, is, is what a high level of emotional experiencing would be. Uh, for the psychedelic treatment, I believe that there, or I have, there is a hypothesis that this uh, level that we can uh, externally observe um, is changed in a patient. But the answer, we don't really know. Uh, so um, that would be, uh, and it's usually in psychoanalysis and humanistic um, therapies, it's a long process. So uh, if it really uh, happens in this, what I believe is a life-changing experience, and that's why it would make so much sense uh, that it changes, um, then uh, that would be of a great advantage from a psychotherapeutic perspective. I would just comment on how people very frequently say, I did not experience what I wanted, but I experienced what I needed, you know? Uh, sort of like in the ayahuasca religions that use DMT in South America, uh, you go, when you take the drug, you go into your mind for a lesson and Mother Ayahuasca will teach you something, will give you the lesson of the day. And it might be not at all what you expect. So we have, for example, people who, uh, you know, want to see uh, beautiful, inspiring uh, archetypes. Uh, and all, instead, they find themselves uh, tumbling through unresolved grief maybe from the loss of a, a parent or someone uh, 20 years ago, you know? Not what they expected, you know? But is that a bad trip? 
no, this is intensive psychotherapy potentially, you know? But it, there's a wisdom that I see uh, over and over in the human mind about how the content of a particular psychedelic session gets uh, structured. And it's an amazing process. It's usually wiser than anything we could have planned in advance. Yeah, so in, the, in my introduction, um, I talked a bit about my personal experience with having this very uh, intense traumatic event in my life and how um, I came out uh, at the other end feeling uh, reinvigorated and wanting to explore more things in life. And um, I can't help but, but to, to think that many of the descriptions that we've heard about today have this sort of um, transformative um, 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 process to them, right? This, this uh, transformative quality to them. And a lot of people have been asking uh, questions along these lines. Uh, for example, um, some people uh, report to experience this type of transformative process uh, when they do meditation for, for a very long time. Others, like, like, um, like Bill just said, after having uh, what they would uh, initially call a bad trip, then come out saying that it was a, an intense uh, therapeutic uh, moment for them. So I'm curious to... What are your thoughts about these types of experiences when they go sometimes not in, in such a positive valence and, and most specifically I've lost Tiago. So I think I think we lost Tiago, but I think we're still online. I think we have been left by ourselves, <laughs> <laughs> more privately. Oh, oh, they're back. We're back. back. <laughs> Welcome back. Oh, thank you. This was a trip. Oh, yeah. What a what a trip. But I, I don't know if you uh, got me until the end. But I was I was curious to ask, uh, in particular, uh, in the clinic. Um, how uh, how do we deal with this type of uh, of situation when when something when the patient reports going through a bad experience or how do we integrate this type of uh, what people uh, initially call a negative experience and help the the patient integrate it and turn it into something um, positive in the long run? So that was my my question. Yeah, in terms of guiding people through sessions, it's always in and through. You know, if, if there's suffering, if there's fear, if there's darkness, if there's a monster, you confront it, you go towards it. And your guide is there to put a hand on your shoulder or hold your hand if that's appropriate, you know, and to support you in confronting and welcoming whatever emotions are emerging. So there's nothing to avoid, there's nothing to fear. Uh, I think my working hypothesis has been, if it comes into consciousness, that means you're ready to deal with it. And you don't have to be afraid of, quote, releasing too much too soon. You know, and we've seen that over and over. Uh, but you have to be grounded in a really good relationship. And you have to have the inner intention to... Uh, move in and through suffering and not just try to escape from it, you know? Uh, spiritual yeah. and psychological growth can be hard work, uh, but it's incredibly re rewarding, you know? Okay, so maybe another question is, um, how far are we from having doctors prescribing psilocybin? Is that for me? Take it away. <laughs> I I think I think uh, we're we're probably uh, not very far, but I don't think we're too close, right? I mean, the the, the trials are ongoing, and uh, uh, we need to finish the trials, 
and then uh, the results need to be assessed. And then there's uh, a, a, what I believe might be the greatest challenge if the trials are positive, which is working out access. And Bill touched on that. And I think he touched on that critically. Uh, uh, and, and I mean, even for uh, uh, other treatments that have actually been validated recently, uh, like um, um, and under under similar rationales, ultimately, like the 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 ketamine derivative that has been had that has had some trials and that has been validated by FDA and EMA, uh, it, it's it the trials have happened. The regulatory agencies have spoken. It's still not very much available. So um, uh, it, it's it's uh, at least in Portugal, for example, almost. Uh, impossible to be treated with it. So I think we're quite some time away. And, and I think the, the biggest challenges are still to come. That's, that's my, my take on it. Great, thank you, Albino. Now a question for Zach. Um, so there are some reports mentioning that psychedelics can work as a shortcut compared to decades of meditation. Is this really true? Uh, do they affect the same brain areas? Do we know about this? <laughs> I'm, I'm gonna take the easy answer, which is we don't know. <laughs> I mean, it's a great, it's a great question. Um, I, I don't think, actually, I don't know if there are any studies on that particular question. I, I think no, but maybe, maybe someone else in the panel would know. Um, there's a lot of hot debate, I think, amongst meditation aficionados versus, uh, versus those that, that favor psychedelics about whether it is possible to get the authentic effect of years of meditation in, in such a short amount of time. But I, I don't think scientifically there's much basis to answer that, unfortunately. I like to think that there are um many techniques of exploring these other states of consciousness. You know, all kinds of different uh, meditative procedures, for example. Uh, there's sensory isol isolation and sensory flooding. There's uh, natural childbirth for some uh, lucky women can be incredibly uh, transformative and beautiful. Uh, there's a musical performance, there's athletic heights. Uh, you know, there's lots of different triggers of these states, and they happen spontaneous to some people. Sometimes really good atheists have these experiences in the middle of the night, you know, <laughs> and there they are, you know. Uh, but um, the unique value potentially of psychedelics is their potency and their reliability. You know, that in one six hour period, you can guarantee that something really significant is going to happen, you know, and that's hard to do with most meditative procedures. That doesn't mean uh, they can't work well together, you know. Um, you can fly across the Atlantic or you can take a, a boat. Uh, if you take a boat, you'll probably see more whales, you know but it's gonna take longer. <laughs> yeah, so um, we're about uh, to wrap up our uh, discussion here, but I have one final question. And that question is for Bill, but I think for everyone else. And uh, the question is um, about uh, something that is I very close to my heart and I presented in the beginning, which is uh, how can we learn from the past so that we make sure that this type of research stays ethical and uh, well-performed and also that we can keep researching the, the potential of these substances for a very, very long time without any more of these uh, very long interruptions. Well, part of it is we certainly communicate respectfully with one another. Uh, in the research community, we police one another. Uh, we will very soon have standards and certification procedures for therapists and researchers, uh, codes of ethics. 
and so on. Uh, it's very much like, uh, I think of the hospice movement that a few decades ago was just Cicely Saunders in London. And now it's everywhere. And there's training of hospice providers, there's certification of hospice providers, there's uh, organizations you belong to, et cetera. And I think something similar like that is going to happen with psychedelic therapy, you know. Um, and we're moving ahead as wisely and uh, uh, sanely as we can. Don't push the river, but do good research. Okay, this is great. Thank you all for joining um, us. Uh, now, as researchers, of course, me and Tiago couldn't avoid performing a little experiment with you tonight. And so we're gonna show you the results of poll number one and number three, which uh, you might have noticed um, they are the same question. And so actually uh, <laughs> comparing the results, it seemed like people were already skewed to the right, which means that they were already considering taking uh, psychedelics as a treatment for mental health disorders. And it seems that towards the end, um, that, that trend maintains. Uh, so that, that's good, I guess. <laughs> we didn't change your minds to... to yeah, to well, we did change their people's minds a bit. <laughs> a tiny bit. <laughs> a tiny bit. Yes, more At least. The right. um, yeah, um, and uh, I think that was it for content, but we still have a uh, few more things to say. Uh, first of all, um, so yeah. For, it was really a pleasure to have you, all of you here with us in this mesmerizing night. We hope uh, you have enjoyed it. For us, it was also a bit different, um, as you might have seen some <laughs> trouble, because this is our first um, event online ever. Usually, are used to our auditorium where there is no there's more eye look, look, mice looking at us, but different kind of troubles with technicalities and stuff. And uh, let me take that cue and uh, find a, a moment to thank all of the amazing art production team, uh, Alex and Sarah, which are here in the room with us. And uh, we're a very small team due to COVID. <laughs> That's why I had to run in and out of the camera a few times. Uh, we'd also like to thank all of the uh, science communication team, uh, uh, especially Diogo and Tiago uh, Coelho that helped us make the amazing presentations that you saw um, today. Um, and uh, thank, of course, the uh, Champagne Foundation for uh, hosting this event. Um, and, uh, and for all the people involved in the production, Katerina Ramos, Pimentel, yeah, Eric, uh, all of you guys, all of the art team, you are amazing. So it was really a pleasure. And so stay tuned. We'll have uh, another art event coming soon. This one on implicit bias. Um, yeah, so stay tuned and hopefully you can join us in a couple of months again. And of course, thank you to our panelists uh, and a round of applause for those at home. Uh, exactly. We haven't clapped in a long time, so maybe we can do it right now from our sofas. Thank you very much. Much. Good evening.